I tried to organize my post-it notes just recently. I think it might end in tears, but we'll try and <laughs> Okay. You get so many in there that it spoils the whole point of having them. <laughs> this is a chapter called How to Court a Lady, and if it gets kind of disjointed, it's because I'm jumping to the good bits off. <laughs> no, I mean, it's all good for heaven's sake. I'll be with you, damn it. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't, I didn't have to sleep with him for it either. <laughs> <laughs> the ad in the village voice read, Andy Warhol presents Nico singing to the sounds of the Velvet Underground. It was February 1967 and Leonard back in New York turned up the collar on his raincoat and walked through the East Village to the Tom. Warhol had taken it over for his own plastic uh, exploding inevitable show. Is there exploding plastic inevitables, I should say. Uh, and what Andy Warhol managed the Velvet Underground, who was the uh, house band there. But Warhol's degree, the singer and songwriter Lou Reed, a short young Jewish New Yorker, shared the spotlight with a tall blonde German woman in her late 20s. Mm -hmm. Nico said Lou Reed, quote, set some kind of standard for incredible looking people. <laughs> Leonard happened upon Nico by chance. One night during his last day in New York, he'd wandered into a nightclub, and there she was, posed like Dietrich at the end of the bar. She had a chiseled face, porcelain skin, piercing eyes, and a pretty boy guitar player, who was her sole accompanist as she sang her songs in a strange, deep monotone. Leonard said, I was completely taken. I had been through the blonde trip. I had lived with a blonde girl and felt for some time I was living in a Nazi poster. <laughs> this was kind of a repetition. He was actually referring to Marianne, his girlfriend, who was inspired the song. So there's a bit about Nico, but I'm sure you all know about her. You can read about it afterwards. But she came to New York basically by a circuitous route. She, she'd got a uh, old villain under her thumb so much that he was actually babysitting Ari, her little child, from her relationship with Alan Delon, that gorgeous French actor. She had good taste. <laughs> and anyway, so anyway, she was kind of out in New York and she thought that Albert Grossman was going to manage her as he managed it, and he didn't want to know, but, but Warhol found her and took her in and put her in Chelsea Girls and everything. So we're jumping forward now. Leonard took to following Nico around New York, his unwitting tourist guide leading him from one haunt of the hip and demi monde to another. This is a conversational part with me and Leonard. They intersperse the book every now and then. He says, I remember walking into a club called Max's Kansas City. I'd heard it was the place where everybody went. Mm -hmm. I didn't know anyone in New York. I remember lingering by the bar. I was never good at that kind of hard work involved with socializing. And a young man came over and said, you're Leonard Cohen, you wrote Beautiful Losers, which nobody had read, it only sold a few copies in America. And it was Lou Reed. He brought me over to a table full of luminaries, Andy Warhol, Nico. I was suddenly sitting at this table with the great spirits of the time, he's laughing. Me, but you were more interested in Nico, how did that go? I was, one, I was among the multitudes that wanted Nico. A mysterious woman, I tried to talk to her, I introduced myself, but she wasn't interested. You would imagine that Leonard and Warhol might get along, two men who believed in making their life their work and their work their life, but as with the Veep poets, Leonard claimed not to fit in, they made him feel provincial, he said. According to Danny Fields, though, quote, there was no club Leonard was not part of. We loved him, Nico loved him, he was loved. His reputation was fierce and he was sexy. He didn't have to do very much except not vomit on the table. <laughs> <laughs> I like his standards. Fields was Electra Records' New York A&R man, a close friend of Nico. So we're jumping on now. Nico told Leonard she liked younger men but would not make an exception. A young man du jour, her guitar player, was a fresh-faced singer-songwriter from Southern California, barely 18 years old, <laughs> named Jackson Brown. <laughs> Still my beating heart. <laughs> I know. Please, you're just helping the writing. A surfer boy crossed with an angel. His natural good looks appeared unnatural alongside the cadaverous Warhol and his black-clad entourage. <laughs> Brown had gone to New York on an adventure. Some friends were driving cross-country and needed someone to split the bill. 
Brown grabbed his acoustic guitar and his mother's gas station credit card. <laughs> and when they rolled into Manhattan, looking up through the back window, he saw, quote, all these huge Nico posters everywhere. Really beautiful. They were advertising her solo shows. Opening the show was Tim Buckley. Mm -hmm. A singer-songwriter Brown knew from the Orange County coffee circuit, coffee house circuit. Tim Buckley told him that Nico was looking for a full-time electric guitarist, and he didn't want to do it. He had his own thing going. So Brown borrowed an electric guitar. Nico opened the door to her apartment. She looked him up and down with her famous stare. Liking what she saw, she invited him in. She sang the boy a few of her songs. He assured her he could play them. She asked if he had any songs, and he did actually quite a lot of them, though he didn't have a record deal. He had a publishing contract. The first song he played Nico was These Days, an exquisite pensive ballad he wrote when he was 16 years old after his second acid trip. <laughs> Says Brown, she said, I will do this song. Everybody did a Nico impersonation, she's fun to imitate. She chose two more of his songs and appointed him her new accompanist and lover, both effective immediately. <laughs> Nico lived in his apartment, this is Jackson Brown, and Nico lived in an apartment with her little son, about four years old. And she had a roommate, a really big guy named Ronnie, who wore massive fur coats and had a lot of money. I don't know what he did, I think maybe he was a club owner. He was a very nice guy, but amazingly he didn't seem to have any interest in her at all, except as a friend. I thought, wow, that's incredible. Brown laughs. But I remember Leonard used to come over to the house. <laughs> And you had just become kind of celebrated for Suzanne, which Judy Collins had covered. And he had this really great book he'd written, Beautiful Losers, which he seemed to be embarrassed by for some reason. But he also used to come to the club where he played. He would sit there at the front table and write and look at her. <laughs> the picture he paints is reminiscent of Death in Venice, a solemn <laughs> love-struck old writer. And at 32, Leonard would have seemed old to the teenage brown. Mooning over a dangerous, unattainable beauty, Brown simply assumed that Leonard was writing her a song, and in a way he was, although he was hoping for more than a cover. <laughs> <laughs> Leonard ended up befriending the pair of them. Quote, he would read us the poems he wrote while he watched her, which were very dreamy, amazing poems. On a few occasions, he would go with the two of them to the dawn before Brown broke up with Nico. And they jumped forward a bit there. And Brown said, like at the end of it, about Nico, he said, I really dug her. And so did Leonard. Although he never won her, he was, quote, madly in love with her. Exclaimed Stanley Fields. She didn't do it with Leonard. She did it with Lou Reed, God knows. And Nico worshipped Leonard. She would call him up, oh, Leonard. That's the way she said his name. Would Leonard like my songs? <laughs> Nico was eager to ally herself with creative people. And Leonard was very important to her. She was certainly a girl of conflicted emotions. Though consistent in her taste in men, after Jackson Brown, she moved on to Jim Morrison and Jimi Hendrix, both in their early 20s. This is Leonard talking now. I bumped into Jim Morrison a couple of times, but I didn't know him well. And Hendrix, we actually jammed together one night in New York. I forget the name of the club, but I was there, and he was there, and he knew my song, Suzanne. So we jammed. This is me. You and Hendrix jammed on Suzanne. What did you do with it? Oh, he was very gentle. He didn't distort his guitar. It was just a lucky thing. I did bump into him again. I remember I was walking up 23rd Street, which is the street the Chelsea Hotel was on, and I was with Joni Mitchell, a very beautiful woman, and a big limousine pulled up. And Jimi Hendrix was in the back seat. Mm -hmm. And he was chatting up Johnny on the inside of the river. It didn't matter to him that she was with another man, specifically you. Well, you know, he was a very elegant man, so it wasn't impolite. <laughs> did Joni leave you for him? No, no, she didn't, but Nico did. I went with Nico to hear Jim Morris, and I think he was playing for the first time in New York at a club. And Hendrix showed up, and he was glorious, very beautiful. I'd come with Nico, and it was time to go, and I said, Let's go, and she said, I'm going to stay, you go. <laughs> Some years later, Nico and Leonard bumped into each other in the Spanish restaurant El Quijo uh, and bar El Quixote. When the bar closed, they wound up in Leonard's room in the Chelsea Hotel next door. It was one of the smaller guest rooms. Leonard was only passing through this time. And so they sat together on the bed, side by side, 
continuing the conversation that began downstairs. At one point, feeling encouraged, Leonard put her hands on her arm. Nico swung around and hit him so hard he levitated. <laughs> <laughs> there are stories where flares up in physical brutality, said Danny feels. Her other brutality, the passive brutality, was just making you wonder what she was thinking so much that people fell in love with her. Maybe she wanted him to be a caveman conqueror because men were afraid of her. Nico loved Leonard, we all did. But in 1967, feeling he had, quote, no skill and he'd forgotten how to court a lady, Leonard went back home to his hotel room. His thoughts full of Nico, he wrote, the jewels in your shoulder, a song that never came out. Take this longing, then title the bells. And uh, Joan of Arc, she was the, the muse for Joan of Arc as well. I'm just jumping forward to the end here. He also wrote a song on his first album called One of Us Cannot Be Wrong. After one of the occasions on which Nico sprained him, he went back to his room and, quote, indulged himself in the black magic of candles, the green candles he bought at the nearby magic and voodoo shop. He said, I married these two wax candles, and I married the smoke of two kinds of sandalwood, and did many bizarre and occult practices that resulted in nothing at all except an enduring friendship. Thank you.